Okay, so hello and happy Friday to everyone. Thank you so much for joining me again for another Frequently Asked Questions about beginning with bees. And this is episode 25. Today is Friday, July 12th. I can't believe we've been doing this for 25 Fridays in a row. And if you've seen them before, I'm glad you're back. And thank you to those of you who submitted your questions during the week. Uh, it's great because we have to have stuff to talk about and I appreciate the kind of questions that you're sending in. And we're going to go over those today. If you want to know what questions we're going to talk about, please look down in the video description as always. And line item by line item, we will show and post uh, what questions are addressed here. And this week I'll try to put timestamps next to those two so you can go straight to it. And uh, if you have questions yourself, if you're new, please subscribe, hit the little bell so that you can get notifications when we put up new ones. And I do put up other videos during the week dealing with uh, honeybees and other topics, even sometimes product reviews and things like that. But the emphasis is on honeybees this year. And uh, what else? If you have answers, if you see someone else posting a question and you know that and you've, you've got experience with that, feel free to share your experience and knowledge with those people as well. Always answer one another. I don't uh, stop that from going on. If you've made a video yourself that shows how something works, please go ahead and post that link. I'll release that just as soon as I notice it. Whenever there's a link, it's withheld. And uh, I will release that if it's, if it's not some kind of promo. But if it's a video of you showing how something works or what your bees are doing, Maybe you've got a question. Your bees are doing something odd and you can get a video of it and uh, you want people to look at that and then comment. Feel free to post that link too. That's all interesting and we're all here to learn. And this is for those who are beginning with bees. Uh, if you don't know anything about me, I um, only have eight to 10 hives maximum. I rotate my hives out. I rotate my colonies out. My uh, purpose is to study bee behavior and also to test products relevant to beekeeping. And I share that with you. I've been doing this for a little over 12 years now. And uh, YouTube is just a great way to share the wealth. And if you uh, would like to go on Facebook and join me on Fred's Fine Fowl and Honeybees, the Facebook page is Fred's Fine Fowl. Uh, you can join us there. And I also post links there to new information, sometimes products and things like that. So feel free to join us on social media. Let's jump right into this. The first one is from uh, Mr. Hast. And it says, have you ever noticed bees having trouble keeping track of sugar syrup without volatile additives, such as essential oils? So the question is uh, relevant to the bees' ability to locate resources. And some people put out sugar syrups open feeding. And uh, also sometimes they put it inside their hives and on entry boards. If you're in uh, Australia, for example, open feeding's not even allowed because uh, the concerns are that bees will congregate at the feeding station, they'll interact with each other, and even Varroa destructor can jump ship and go bee to bee and come into hives that don't previously have Varroa. Australia doesn't deal with Varroa right now, good for them. But uh, here in the United States, it is not illegal to open feed. In fact, a lot of people open feed near their apiaries, 50 feet, 100 feet away. And uh, that's to take the pressure off of the bees that are in the apiary if there are times of dearth when there may be robbing, for example. And robbing is something we're going to talk about today also. But uh, I have not noticed that the bees have problems finding syrup and resources of any kind without essential oils added. Essential oils are supposed to stimulate appetites. They're supposed to, usually it's, you know, lemongrass and other things blended together. Some of the most popular ones are Pro Health, Brood Booster, Honey Bee Healthy, things like that. And they mix them in with sugar syrup. This time of year, most people are mixing 50-50, one to one by weight, sugar to clear water. And then uh, if you put that out, so now sugar, in water by itself really doesn't have a discernible scent. But I can share with you that bees find it fast. Bees find water anyway. If you sat a glass of water out on your patio, a honeybee would happen by and stop and check it out anyway. They taste test it. If they like it, they stick around, they come back. If they don't like it, they get a little sample and fly off. So adding essential oils does not attract the bees more so than just the honey by itself. And you can do tests with uh, sugar syrup. I said honey, but you can do tests with sugar syrup. 
and uh, put it out, get some bees on it, and see how long it takes them to come back with all their friends. They'll use up that sugar syrup very fast. Of course, when there's a nectar flow on, as there is right now where I live, some people are reporting five or 10 pounds per day of honey per hive. They're using those broodminder scales, and that's uh, giving them a readout on their phones that uh, shows what the weight gain is. Weight gain comes from two things in a beehive. It's the nectar coming in, which by the way, is gonna be reduced, so it's gonna lighten up a little bit. Fresh nectar takes up twice the space of finished honey, but you also have new bees being added, so the bees themselves add a lot of weight. So at any rate, the hives are in a rapid gain right now, and there is a nectar flow, so there's a lot going on. We have white clover, the bees are ignoring it. Uh, so there are a lot of other things out there that they're getting it from, and uh, things are good where I live in spite of the weather. Super hot, by the way. If you don't have a vented bee suit and you go out there, it was in the high 80s, 90s this past week, uh, get a vented bee suit. Guardian Bee Apparel is one place that I get my suits from and it's fantastic. So bees will find resources they need to cool off, we need to cool off, we need water, they need water. So there are watering bees that go out and bring in water by itself. They're finding the water everywhere. Scouts are very thorough. They're gonna investigate every detail, every nook and cranny, they're gonna find the resources and then they're gonna return to the hive. Water bees, for example, that fly out, collect water, they don't stop off and get nectar too at the same time. They get water only and they get inside the colony and they spread the water all over, for example, the brood frames and then through evaporation, they keep it cool. High temperatures can put your hives in jeopardy. That's one of the reasons why I have these hive visors on to cool the fronts of my hives and keep things shaded for them. But, uh, so that's it. I mean, bees go to puddles there and everything, so you don't need to add essential oils to get your bees to be attracted to sugar syrup. If they're not taking sugar syrup, they're finding something better in the environment, nectar sources from flowers already. Next is from James Knoll. I live in the northeastern part of Michigan. Is it too late for a split? A double brood, eight frames, hive doing a walkaway split. So he's got double brood. So that I'm guessing that's a double brood box, eight frame hive. Uh, by the way, the eight frame hives, uh, the state inspector told me that they're actually doing better than 10 frame hives. So stacking eight frames on top of each other and expanding that way instead of 10 and then expanding, the eight frames are booming. And I have to say that I had a eight frame deep which had nothing else but the single deep on it made it through winter this year. So eight frames are pretty interesting, but is it too late for a split? I don't think so. Uh, I live in, kind of a rough part. We're not like Vermont, but weather-wise, we're, we're very cold. And in the state of Michigan, I mean, I don't know if you're in the Upper Peninsula area or where you're located. I don't think it's too late. You know, we're in mid-July right now. And a walkaway split, by the way, for those of you who don't know, if you have a colony that's full of brood and uh, the bee population's big and it's our, they're storing honey and they're filling up, they're maxing out, two things are gonna happen. One, you either have to expand it or you're either gonna split it. If you don't split or expand the colony, the likelihood that they're gonna swarm, and they may swarm anyway, could happen at any time. So right now, this past week, I got a huge swarm, and uh, the temperature's high, and I just now got all my supers on, so I don't even know which colony they came from, but what's a walk away split? Well, if you open up your colony, you set another box next to it and you split the brood and you put brood in one and you leave half the brood and open brood, by the way. So there's capped pupae that you want. And there's also open brood, which are the larvae. And you want those to exist. If there's some eggs even, that's great too. Now, do you have to find the queen and do that split before you walk away? No, because if you put her in the new box, the, the ones that you left from will be of course making queen cells. If you're fortunate enough to open up the box and see that they already have supersedure cells, which are in the middle of the frames of brood, little peanut sagging cells that stick out, or if you already have swarm cells along the fringe of your brood frames, several of them, then I would leave uh, queen cells in the hive that you're taking from and put some in the hive that you're putting it in. Because now we already have, if they're capped, we know that we're less than 15 days from having a new queen come out. So that saves some time, plus you have brood. A walkaway split means you take everything apart, you split up the resources, 
you split up the brood and just what it says, you walk away and let the bees take care of that on their own. So if you have multiple queen cells in both, that's a great situation to be in. I would go ahead and do it. Keep in mind, when I give advice here, and it's based on my personal experience, because I do splits like that all the time, I just pull everything in half, leave it alone, and I don't even look for the queen, as long as it's open brood and everything that I described. And uh, I just let them build up, and I haven't had a colony fail that way. So when you walk away and do that, you lose honey production, obviously. I'm not into honey production, I'm into bee behavior. So the things that I do don't always make sense. If you're a commercial keeper or you're trying to expand and you're trying to generate a pile of honey or you collect you know, pollen resources from your hives or you're trying to produce a bunch of beeswax so that you can sell that, that is the polar opposite of what I do. So what I do is just take care of the bees and see what they do and keep them healthy and get them preparing for winter. That's all I'm doing right here preparing for winter. Now we put on flow supers. Does that mean I won't be taking their honey off? Yeah. Why do I put flow supers on? Uh, I can't do any more splits. All my boxes are full. So, and I can't collect any more swarms. All my boxes are full unless I start, you know, taking boxes that I have around that I use for training. Um, so the thing is, I put on flow supers so that I don't have to expand the colonies. In other words, when they fill up the flow hives, and they start to cap those, I drain those off, and then they're available again for them to fill again. I will get on average three cycles of honey from each flow super. So, and that's several gallons of honey per hive. So that's more than enough for me. So the advice I'm giving you is relevant to the bees making it, not relevant to you profiting as a beekeeper and generating maximum honey. If uh, he doesn't want to do, like James, you know, is it too late to do a walk away split? Well, when you divide resources like that, you are going to suffer losses in production. You're going to have a temporary loss in uh, the number of bees that are in there, which relates directly to production. More bees, more workforce, more production, more honey, more nectar, more everything. So uh, the other option is to keep that eight frame and stack more supers onto it and create, you know, what I call super colonies and let them expand. The flip side of that is at the end of the season, you're gonna be taking off those honey supers and condensing the boxes back down in order for them to survive what sounds like it's going to be a very rough uh, Michigan winter. So they say our winters are gonna come sooner and last longer. Meteorologists. Anyway, so it's not too late in my opinion for a walk away split. You will suffer losses. You will not uh, get the honey that you otherwise would. So it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you want to expand your apiary with another colony, I don't think it's too late. There are things that people say. A swarm in May is worth a load of hay. A swarm in June is worth a silver spoon. And a swarm in July, let them fly because the chances of a swarm making it past July. Now, where did the people live that came up with that line? I've collected swarms in August and September and had them make it, so. Now, it just means that they're not going to produce a lot of resources for you that year. If you collect a swarm late season, all you're trying to do is get them built up to get themselves through winter. Next one is from Rick McDaniel. Are thermal treatment methods for Varroa mites effective? Okay, that's kind of a landmine of a question. Because I think uh, Rick is asking, uh, there is a system out there right now that is designed to heat up a hive, get your bees warmed to the point that uh, the bees themselves are highly stressed. They're at a point of being in jeopardy, but they raise the temperature high enough to kill Varroa destructor mites, but not high enough to kill off the bees. And, uh, you know, methods, are they, is that an effective method? So, I recommend that you go and watch their videos and see about thermal treatments. I know that when you stress your bee colony, for example, when would you even do that? You're going to want to do it when you don't have honey on because honeycomb does not like high temperatures. If you have to heat the entire hive and you bring it up to the threshold where it's going to kill varroa mites, you risk even sagging honeycomb and things like that. Um, you create a high humidity environment, you create a high stress environment. What you're trying to do is push the bees to their limit, not kill the bees, and then 
kill off varroa mites and then bring those temperatures back down. First of all, that process takes a long time. It takes like 30 minutes per hive. Uh, the other thing is the thermal stresses on adult bees, there are some die-offs there. And I did watch one of the videos of somebody who's inventing something like that. This is also why I don't like to talk about things like that. I'm, I'm not about following people around with some new invention and tearing them apart over it or being critical of the invention. I think that they are in process. I think that they are still learning and working it out. Your hive has to be airtight. You are uh, the stress, the bees that died. I noticed in one video they showed there were dead bees on the bottom. And uh, they said, yeah, but when you see a dead bee on the bottom, first of all, it's an older bee, it was going to die anyway, already, you know, near death or something. And they said, if you pick that bee up, you're going to see a Varroa destructor underneath of it that's dead. So that means that when they did the thermal treatment, uh, the Varroa died and detached from the bee. A Varroa dying and detaching itself from a honeybee should not cause the honeybee's death. There are other concerns about the thermal method for treating for mites. And that is that uh, the impact on brood, it can cause the brood development to be interrupted. It can cause developing brood to be negatively impacted by that high thermal situation. So let's think about what we're doing to the bees. We're, we're closing up the hive. They're putting a heat pad underneath and they have heat sensors to make sure that it gets to certain temperatures so that it will be damaging to the varroa mite. When they increase those temperatures, they have to hold it. There has to be a dwell time at that temperature. What are the bees doing during that time frame? The bees are going to be fanning as fast as they can. They are going to be trying to cool a hive that can't be cooled because it's closed off. And how long is this going to last? A long time. So we're, we're stressing the bees and we're stress testing the bees to some degree. And then that we're also heating brood. So you're heating brood higher than it should be. Uh, and so there's some discussion going on. Now I'm not going to say, you know, how effective it is. Uh, does it kill all the mites? Um, I don't know the final results from anyone other than those who are selling the product. So what we really need is secondary testing, secondary science. So we need people to look at the efficacy of this process. How many of those mites are dying out? And then if they do mite checks afterwards, how many mites remain? And here's the big question. What is the potential negative impact on developing brood? Which is the larvae and the brood are the most sensitive parts of the hive. That's why the bees concentrate their thermal control over brood frames. They're trying to keep that at 94 to 96 degrees. They're also trying to maintain the humidity over the brood. They're also trying to ventilate the brood because it's critical there. That's why you see bees parked on the brood frames, venting and keeping that gas exchange going. So you're gonna lock them up, heat up the whole colony, and the brood is of interest because that's where the varroa are and we wanna kill them off. So I would say it's up in the air, you know, if that's, uh, if that's a great method or not. I just wanna see more testing from people I'm not, people have asked me if I would get one and test it. I don't want one. And the reason I don't want one is it's, it's a very complicated process. And uh, also we're already using varroa resistant survivor bees, hygienic bees. Obviously I don't breed my bees for genetics because I don't have enough hives to make that meaningful. What I do is I buy in bees that are already demonstrating the appropriate traits that resist varroa, resist disease, without treatment. And I get those from um, the Weaver family, Bee Weaver in Texas. And the ones I'm testing this year are Saskatras bees also. But they have you know, not such a great success rate with Varroa, so they may require treatment. And that's from the people that are, that are breeding them. So if I have to treat, so that's the other thing, if I wouldn't want to use the thermal thing, and I, and I don't, I don't want to. You have to run an, uh, you know, electricity out there and everything else to do it, which isn't the end of the world if it works really well. I just don't like the potential impact on the brood itself and the stress on the bees, of course. Um, so I'm using oxalic acid vaporization if I have to. If I do varroa counts and my varroa numbers are so low that the bees are handling it on their own, I'm not treating with anything. I am prepared to treat. And if I treat, I'm gonna use oxalic acid vaporization. 
the Octavape 110 that I showed you the last time that I was uh, had a Q&A. So the thermal treatment methods for ROA effective. We need to get that information from someone other than the people marketing the device. Because what I hear is from people that buy it from them, recycling the exact same information that people have said when they're marketing it. So I'm not saying it works, I'm not saying it doesn't, I'm saying there are concerns about what happens to the developing larvae and the, uh, the capped brood as well. What is the impact? And I also, I don't like the, the story about a varroa falling off the bee, therefore the bee died. That's, in my opinion, just not a good explanation for why bees are dying. Next, uh, we show us how to make hive visors. Okay, several people asked about this, and I showed it in the beginning of this, I showed it in my rain thing. These are my hive visors. And all it does is it goes on the front of your hive like this, and it shields it from rain, and it shields it from intense sun. So we've had some real heat waves this week. And uh, just shielding things from rain makes this thing worthwhile. I don't really think I need to make a video on how to make it, but I wrote the specs on here for you. These are all the parts that you need to make it. So it's a very simple thing. It's three pieces of wood. So we have the one by eight, then we have these side pieces, which I've decided to make out of oak. We have wing nuts up here that are quarter 20 threaded, they're two inches long. And then we have little metal threaded receivers that they go through and the dimensions are on here. And these dimensions are for a 10 frame Langstroth box. So if it goes for 10 frame and these screws are two inches long, then this will also attach to an eight frame hive. So this, this is the final configuration that I've arrived at. I started with them being really short and stout. I glue them up with tight bond glue and I put two stainless steel screws on each end. The beginning groups, I only glued and clamped them. That was a fail, they came apart later. I also like adding oak strips on the sides here because that makes these pieces of wood nice and stiff and uh, it's working great. If you put these on an eight frame box, you can put little three quarter inch wooden shims in between here and then they just press up against the box so you can take up that space. And so you end up with a nice wide rain or sun visor. I haven't decided yet if I'm leaving this on through winter, but we're gonna continue testing with them. And uh, that's pretty much it. And I used the tight bond two wood glue. So that's it. They're easy to make, they work great. I shot them with a thermal camera. Uh, the exposed area of the hive above these and below is a 20 degree drop when the sun is hitting the hive. So it is a significant thermal drop on those really hot days for those of you in very hot climates. Paint it white maybe. I just paint it with whatever paints I have around so that's how I end up with those wonky colors and that's how I painted my swarm box here. But uh, I don't think it really, they're cut at 30 degree angles. It's so basic. I don't really think that I need a video to show you how to do that. If you really want a video of me showing you step by step how to make it, I will do it. It just, um, it's very simple. But uh, it would be a five minute video. So if you need it, put that in the comment section. Yes, I want to see that video. Or if somebody makes the comment, yes, please show a video step by step making the high visor and everybody clicks like on that. And if I get five likes on that comment, I will do a video that shows how to make it. Okay, will you show us how to make it? That's done there. Number four, Carolyn Frank, could you please discuss backfilling versus what a normal frame of brood adjacent to food stores looks like? What are the bees trying to do in backfilling? Okay, first of all, uh, for those of you who don't know what backfilling is, I'm going to tie this into something else. Look what I'm showing you here today. This is a brand new comb material. This looks like regular bee comb, right? And it is soft. This looks like drawn wax and it feels like drawn wax and it bends and compresses like drawn wax. And guess what? It's synthetic. This is synthetic pre-drawn comb, and who do you think it comes from? Betterbee.com. So, now, this is not a promotion for them. I bought these just like everybody else. They didn't send me any. I wish they would have sent me some for free. I'd like to do that. But so, what is this stuff good for? 
I mean, we're already, this isn't plastic. In fact, I'm gonna put a link down in the video description so you can read what this thing is made out of. These things are very soft, so where would you use it? Um, and th this ties in with the uh, brood question here, the expanding question. If you catch a swarm of bees and you put them in a box and you don't have drawn out comb for them, instead you've got regular foundation. So what I do is I put in these are acorn heavy wax frames and my bees build these out really fast. These are my favorite one piece plastic frames. So, but the bees have to draw their comb before they start laying eggs, before they start storing resources, whether it's nectar, whether it's pollen resources and so on, they have to make comb first. And that is the most demanding resource that the bees will ever have to build in the hive is building honeycomb. So the people at Better Bee, this stuff just came out this year. I don't know how many months it's been out or whatever, but I ordered it right away because I'm going to evaluate it. The next swarm that I get, even though I said earlier I'm through catching swarms, I have this box left. This is my last one. So if I get a swarm, it's going to be to test out this new synthetic frame material. So this is synthetic comb. Uh, it's held in here just with... Um, toothpicks and I'm running a video up in the corner here showing you coming out of the box what they look like and uh, you get the frames you get the comb you put this together yourself you hold it and this is only good for the brood frame so when you put these in the brood frame and the arrangement is you know I have four acorn frames in the middle and then the these are are grouped on the outside of the box that go in my coffee anyway and then they're grouped on either side. So these are together two or three on each side and then your acorn frames or whatever you have for the bees to work with in the center. And uh, the thinking is that the bees are gonna be able to go right into these and start using these and storing their resources immediately. I like the concept. I don't know if it's working. By the way, a bunch of people wrote on uh, my last YouTube when we were talking about this and said, yeah, I've got those. Yeah, I bought those too. If you bought them and you've got them and they're working or not working, please write that in the comment section. They're called the uh, Better Comb. So if you write a comment, say, hey, the Better Comb is working. Better Comb is a fail. Um, what goes on with that? How's that going? So backfilling, when we get to a frame of brood, uh, backfilling is just the bees putting stuff where it shouldn't be. If you had a frame that had brood on it every time the brood hatches out the next thing that's going to happen is the queen's going to come along and that empty cell is going to be filled with a new egg and i have a queen right now that's laying eggs every eight to ten seconds that is we were timing her my wife and i were watching in the observation hive and she is dropping eggs like crazy so anyway what happens though if the queen goes to lay an egg and in the middle of that broom frame there's a bunch of nectar what now? Well, every cell that's full of nectar is a cell that can't be filled with an egg. So that goes without saying. So why are they doing that? Well, during the day, first of all, the forages are out and when there is a nectar flow on, they are getting back and they're unloading that nectar to interior working bees, what I call storekeeper bees. And those bees are, they touch tongues, they're unloading, they pass off from their crop to the next one. And the next one that lives inside the hive that's never been outside fills those cells. And the reason is production is so high, they're out of places to put the nectar. So they start to fill the brood frame with it. And there's also another term called honey bound. And that means that all the available cells just start getting filled with resources for the bees and we don't have a place to put the eggs. So that's counterproductive for the hive. Why do they do it? They're out of space. So what's the fix? Expand the hive. So you need to, so your brood frame, let's say it's a deep box and your brood is all in there and they start to fill that with nectar. Chances are, if you look at your honey super, it's full too. And here's the problem too, with a rapid onset of a nectar flow, the bees go into overdrive. And if you're not paying attention, if you don't go by and grab the boxes and try to lift them and realize when they're really getting heavy and uh, when they are really heavy, you need to look at the top box and see if it's full of honey. If it is, it's time to add another box. Don't even wait. I get that question a lot recently. Uh, you know, when should I put on another box? You know, I have a 10 frame 
and they filled six of them, is it too soon to put on another box? No, it's not too soon. If there's a nectar flow, get the other box on there now. How much space does nectar take up in the colony? Twice as much space as honey. Because nectar, when it's brought in, is a, is a high water percentage. It's going to be dehydrated down to about 50% of what it is when it's brought in. Therefore, then they'll move it around and they'll keep condensing it. That's why sometimes you'll, this is really beneficial with the flow hives because we can pull the panel off and we can see the end frames and you'll see them fill those cells with nectar, but then they're dehydrating it and you'll actually see the cells recede a little bit over a period of hours and days. So they need twice the storage space to make half the honey. Does that make sense? So when there's a nectar flow on, they're filling everything. There's a lot of water, a lot of moisture in there. That's why it's also a high time when the bees will be found outside your hive and not inside. You'll see thousands of bees clustered, bearding off the landing board, clustered on the hive. And by the way, these hive visors, the bees cluster up underneath of them. So even that protects those bees from rain and weather. So hive visor, good move. Anyway, I'm off track. So you want to expand that hive and give them the most space you know, the most space you can provide for those bees at the time of the nectar flow. Then of course, when nectar flows are over and when periods of dearth and everything, that's when you look at maybe condensing it a little bit. Also, I'd like to mention for those who feed their bees, don't use landing board feeders. If you're gonna put feed directly on a hive, put it up inside, inside a uh, feeder shim or something like that and have it enclosed and inaccessible to the outside bees. Also, don't add pheromones. There's no reason to add essential oils and things like that to uh, your honey, that's your honey, your sugar water that's being provided for bees during periods of dearth to keep them going. Or when the season's done and you've drawn off all your honey, you're also letting them clean up their cells and their frames on their own. So, you know, a normal frame should have nothing but brood on it in the field and then on the on the edges of the frame you'll see pollen and you'll see corners filled with honey resources that are right there that's for their immediate use if it starts to fill the field you have a real problem because the queen can't lay and you need to provide space and frames for her to do that that's the other thing if you don't do that soon enough they have to make comb if you're new to beekeeping you don't have bee comb these uh, frames from better bee are not good for honey supers at all they won't hold up to spinning and uh, they're not even recommending that you use it for that. They're only for brood. So uh, you can't just grab these pre-drawn out frames of stuff from Better Bee and put them up in honey supers and provide an immediate storage area. I'm not saying they won't use it. I'm saying the Better Bee says not to. So provide space and in enough time for them to build comb so that they'll have a place to put the nectar because it doesn't do any good to add a bunch of frames that doesn't have comb on it, that doesn't have a place to store it. But uh, so if they're already backfilling, creating a honey bound situation, you're about to lose a pile of bees uh, through two ways. One, they might swarm because they're out of space. Number two, because there are fewer eggs being laid, fewer brood down the road. So if they're not laying eggs now, 21 days away, they're not hatching. So you're going to be reducing colony strength probably at a critical time. So expand the hives early as soon as you know that something like that's going on. What else did I have here? So two pages this time. Here we go. How do you set up, how do you stop robbing on newly made splits and nucleus hives? And this is Graham from uh, Ireland. So that's cool. Anyway, I like that people all over the world are seeing this, but I have a lot to say about uh, what to do. First of all, like this week, I housed a, or hived a uh, swarm of bees. So they don't have any resources. They're not uh, really prone to, for robbing, but we do want to reduce the entrance. So there are a lot of things that you can do, and this is timely because guess what just came? This came to me this week, and these are from Be Smart Design robbing screens. So we're gonna talk about that too, but I wanna talk about what everybody already has. So if you've got, he says, New splits, nucleus hive. So what's the problem there? Well, the workforce is small. The uh, number of defending bees, the guard bees are reduced and they might have a lot of resources, especially because when we do splits or when we set up a uh, swarm or something like that, chances are hopefully you put sugar syrup in there so that they can get a good start. And uh, so 
we have a reduced number of bees, they're kind of in jeopardy and we need to protect them. So the most obvious thing that you're gonna do is to put on, this is an eight frame entrance reducer. We wanna reduce that to, that one looks like it's right about an inch. And uh, you're gonna see if there's no traffic jam here, they can defend this. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie called The 300, but uh, 300 men stood off thousands in what they called the hot gates. And that's because the enemy had to pass through a narrow passage. And so even a few guard bees can fend off a whole horde of yellow jacket wasps that might come and try to steal their stuff. Or worse yet, robbing bees. Robbing bees can hit a hive, rob it out completely in just a matter of minutes. It, once the scouts get through and they get to the honey resources, if there's any in there and they find out that they can't defend that, they're gonna sweep in there by the hundreds, if not thousands, and clean it out. So uh, you can defend that by putting this in and do that early. So if this is a, you know, he has a, a nuke box. Some of those have the wheels on them that let things in. So you want to reduce the entrance there too. Uh, entrance reducer, and then as their numbers get bigger, of course, you just swap out your entrance reducers, make them a little bigger. And then that's as big as you need it to be. A huge hive can come and go through that. And also make sure they don't have an upper entrance when it's a new colony. Uh, you can do an upper entrance later when the numbers are big and then you know they can defend the resources. But here's what came out from Be Smart Design. This is actually a robbing screen and it is made, it's fully vented on the front. It has tabs on the sides that you can break off if you need it for an eight frame. This is set up for a 10 frame. So it's fully vented. Now here's the thing, when bees are robbing, a colony when they're robbing a hive they like to fly straight in get what they need and fly straight out so if you've got a colony that's being overwhelmed that can't hold its own then as soon as nightfall comes first of all you want to put an entrance reducer on it right away but an entrance reducer if they're already under attack isn't even going to do the trick so now we have to go to some kind of robbing screen and a lot of people make that so what we want to do is block the bees from me being able to the robbing bees from being able to fly directly in and fly directly out with whatever they've stolen. So the robbing screen redirects the activity. And the reason you do it at night is so that the bees that have gone out foraging that day know where to get back in. Because if you do this while your forages are out and you put this thing on and the push pins come with it, you can push this right on. I just barely pushed them in because this is for demonstration purposes. You probably wanna take a tack hammer or something and, and tack them in and make sure this is nice and firm but there are these openings on the top. And so what happens is overnight you put this on and then you'll open one or two of these depending on the population of the colony you're defending. And uh, once these are open, the bees inside will come to this outside the front, they'll go up and they'll leave through the top. Robbers don't wanna come in and go down and then come through. So this stops robbing or greatly reduces it and gives them an entrance and exit route through the top of the screen, which helps them forage, come back without being attacked and without being overwhelmed at the entrance, which is where it all happens. Now there's a couple of modes for this too. So this is double duty. One is it's a robbing screen. So it's vented, has these exit points, open or close them as you like, if you just wanna open one side or whatever. But again, the foragers, before they go out, you need this installed so they know how to get back in. Otherwise, they'll just hang here because they can smell through here and they'll just be here trying to get in and not figuring it out. They'll pace back and forth. So do it at night. The other thing is this doubles as a mouse guard. So there's little squares here on the corner, right there. And you take one of the push pins and it's pre-creased in here so the push pin can go through the center. And what that does is creates a standoff that's big enough for the bees to come and go through the bottom, but it is too small for a mouse to get through. Now, could a mouse stand there and chew that plastic apart? Probably if it was a really tenacious mouse, but if they're just opportunistic and they're cruising by and they jump up on this landing board and they wanna see if they can get in and they realize they can't get through that, that mouse is gonna move on for an easier access to something else. So, double duty. It's a screen for robbing bees and it is a mouse guard.
So those are my recommendations. If you've got a nucleus or you've just made a split, anytime you've reduced the numbers in your bees and they're having problems defending themselves while you build them back up, some kind of robbing screen is the most extreme. Entry reducer, keep that entrance and only have one entrance. Don't have an upper entrance for the bees until their numbers are up, until they can defend themselves. And that is everything for today. So thank you for watching. I hope you're going to have a great weekend. Please let me know if you have questions. Write them in the comment section below and we'll talk about those next week. If you have further questions about anything I talked about today, please feel free to ask more about that. And again, don't forget, you want to see how to build a high visor. Go ahead. First person to make that comment, find that comment, give it a thumbs up if you want to see it. I'll make them. I don't care. I'm not trying to market those. I'm just putting the information out. Thanks for watching as always. Have a good day.